I am going to discuss my trip to Scotland along the West Highland Way with the Winthrop University Physical Education class. The first thing is discussing the similarities between the Scottish British culture and US culture. One of the things I noticed is the cost of items. They're very similar in cost. I know when I was buying some souvenirs they seem to only be a couple pounds which is pretty normal because in America our you know little trinkets that people would come and get are only a couple dollars. So it seemed to be about the same, even though the exchange rate is a little different. So I ended up spending more money on those items. But in relation to their currency, they seem to be about the same price. Um, people are very polite. I know along the trail, we ran into many people and everyone was super friendly, except for the one guy during lunch who didn't like me cheering him on. Uh, people love to be outdoors, just like how they are here in America. You saw a lot of people outside. It seemed like most people I saw were very fit. And I, I know this is skewed given that I only saw a very active trail. So that's not to say that people in the entire country are this way. But it seemed to be that a lot of people enjoyed being outdoors and being around nature. Uh, people love to drink. That's very apparent, and that's also how it is here in America. I know we went to a bar most nights, and you could tell that it was definitely something that people enjoyed to do. Even when we ended the trail and even along the Royal Mile, there were lots of places for people to get drinks. Um, another thing is one of the bars that we went to for two nights in a row to eat dinner, a little pub, they had a pool table. And pool tables are very common here in America to go out to like um, pubs and things like that. The only difference in the playing of pool was some of the rules. We play here in America if, you know, you hit someone else's ball in, like, it just kind of gives the upper hand to the other person. But they play in Scotland that if you are stripes but you hit a solid ball in, then the other team then gets two shots in a row, which I thought was interesting. And, like, if you scratch, the other team gets to put the ball wherever they want, like normal, but then they also get two shots in a row. So that was pretty interesting to play that way. Uh, dogs was another thing that I saw a lot. I saw dogs quite a bit along the trail when we would go into towns. And I know I'm biased because I do have a little puppy girl. But I saw dogs everywhere. And then the only difference with the dogs is I didn't see any dogs on leashes. A lot of the dogs were very trained off leash and would follow people along the trail without needing a leash. Some of them didn't even have collars on, and that's not something that you see here in America very often. Now, there will be, like, spots where it says off-leash dogs, but it's usually a fenced-in area or a dog park or a fenced-in bar or something like that. It's very strange to see a dog off-leash out in public here in America. Some other difference was that it's very clean, um, and I know it's Leave No Trace, along the West Highland Way and that could contribute to it but I felt like the country was very clean and I didn't see a lot of litter or a lot of trash along the way and that's something that I know outside my apartment complex alone I see you know garbage and trash left over bojangles and things like that all over the ground so I thought that was um, pretty interesting to see how clean it was the weather you know, I think it's pretty similar to Florida weather in the sense of it rains every day. Even if it only rains for, you know, an hour or so, it was like those afternoon storms. But one thing I found interesting is some of our tour guides at AOP would tell us that, oh, this is heavy rain, it's going to be heavy rain this afternoon. And while it was raining, we were like, is this it? Like, is this the heavy rain? And they would tell us yes, but it really wasn't that heavy of rain. So I guess our rain here in America is a lot heavier and a lot more dense or like um, thick than it is there. It doesn't rain as hard. Like I would consider it like a light afternoon shower over there instead of like a pour that we see here. A unit of measurement. I know we ran into this quite a bit when we would ask how much farther we have and he would give it to us in kilometers and we'd all have to start converting it to miles or to feet to something that we're used to. So I know the unit of measure is definitely different. And then also the daylight. Over there, it's sunny almost all the time, like it's daylight. So I know when we woke up around like 6 or 7, the sun was up, and we would go out to dinner and leave dinner 10 o'clock, and it would still be sunny outside, or still be light outside, I should say, most of the time it was raining, but it was still light outside. 
And so I think when I had asked about it, they said that it's daylight for the majority of the time during the season. But then later in the season, it's as if they only have about six hours of daylight. So I think that was really interesting to see, actually, the difference in the daylight. It's hard to tell what time it is there because it's always sunny. Um, another thing is international traveling. Um, so I've done a couple international trips before. And so the only thing that's really different this trip is, I guess, customs. Going through customs at each airport is very different. The last two times I went out, I went out of um, Florida. So that customs in comparison to the New Jersey customs is very different. Um, but other than that, I think like the actual flight and the food and all that kind of stuff is pretty the same. Um, packing. This is the first time that I've really had to fit everything in one bag that I was assuming I would have to carry with me at all times. So before I had taken like a 35 day pack, 35 liter day pack, and packed everything in there, but I knew I wouldn't be carrying my pack. And so I really stuffed it full. And so this time when I was packing, like under the impression that I would be carrying all my stuff, it was very difficult to pack light, even with a larger bag than I've had in the past. So definitely packing light clothes. The synthetic clothes are really easy to fit more in there because they were lighter and compact versus like a t-shirt, which is what I've taken in the past. Um, as far as learning things about hiking, um, I've done like normal day trips of hiking, but I've never really done like a multi-day hike. So I learned a couple things. Um, shoes are everything. Having a good, reliable, comfortable pair of waterproof shoes make the world a difference. The first day I wore tennis shoes or what they call trainers, my Nikes, and I thought they were fine. I went the whole day. You know, my feet hurt a little bit at the end, but I just thought it was from all the travel. But the next day I decided to wear my um, Keen waterproof hiking shoes that I'd gotten because they had told us that we might be getting wet. And I never wore my tennis shoes again. I wore my Keen um, hiking shoes every day for the rest of the trip because my feet were so comfortable, it didn't hurt stepping on any of the rocks. When they got wet, they dried by the time we were finished um, walking around for the day. So I think having a good pair of shoes can make a world of difference. And also the clothing that you select. Um, I did bring a lot of synthetic clothes, and I didn't really focus so much on tops because I knew I would just wear like my rain jacket or you know, a dry fit shirt. But I actually went and got a pair of Columbia um, pants and they're called like everyday outdoor wear pants and they're actually water resistant which came in handy and I ended up wearing those I think five days while we were there because they were just so light they were long so they covered my legs they were water resistant so I really didn't need to put my um, water pants on unless we were you know in the kayak or the canoe or if it was just like what they considered downpouring for the day. Other than that, my Columbia pants really kept me dry, even through the rain. So I think having a good pair of pants, a good pair of shoes, and I wish I would have found another a top that was more of a water resistant looking top to wear. I think that would have been extremely helpful. Um, having snacks and water easily accessible in your pack and having a pack cover for the rain I think is really important and was helpful to learn because I know during the hike I, we didn't want to stop and take a break but you know I just want a quick drink of water so I would just reach right here in the back and grab it and so that was really convenient having like a little snack just like a little cliff bar or something to get you through you know another hour or two of walking before you stop for lunch is really helpful. I did learn a lot biking. This is the first time I've really done any um, intense biking I guess other than recreational on the beach or outside in the neighborhood this is the first time I biked and what was really nice is on the last day we were biking although I wish I would have done the first day we were biking the last day I went to the back with Rachel and we started talking about biking because that's one of the things that she really enjoys and she um, ended up teaching me a lot and so she told me you know like when you're going downhill or you're going extremely fast you don't want to lock your arms or really grasp the handlebars too tight. They call that white knuckles. 
And so if you don't do that, it'll help you use the shock when you're going over rocks, going downhill, versus if you lock your fist and your arms out, then you don't have anything to absorb every time you hit a rock, and so it'd be easier to fall. So keeping your elbows slightly bent and not grasping the handlebar too tight. She also taught me that when you're just coasting, so like after you pedal for a while and then you're just going to coast or if you're going downhill, that you should keep your feet level. And so normally I keep one of my legs straight and one of my legs bent, but she said it's better to have both of them like bent in the middle at the same height. And when you want to sit up, if you just lift your bottom up and you want to try to put it far enough back that almost like you're trying to put it over your back wheel. And so she said that's like the best way to be positioned if you want to stand up versus just standing straight up because it's easier to tip over the front. And so although I really wish I would have learned that on the first day, I am glad I learned that for future reference and how to switch the gears. You really don't need to move the big gears and just move in the small ones on the right side will do a lot more going uphill and downhill and things like that. Um, as far as kayaking and canoeing, I had no idea that you could raft with a canoe. One of the days that we were canoeing, we were really fighting the wind hard on the water. And so what our guides did is they had us pull over and we ended up putting three canoes together to build a raft. And we had everybody paddling except for one person just due to how the seat was positioned, which I thought was really cool and something different to do. Um, and even though it was a lot more work, it was a lot of fun, and I really enjoyed actually doing that despite taking us quite longer to get to camp. Um, it really helps you work as a team too, because like as you get tired, because once you sit in the raft, you're on one of the sides. So like if you're on this side, you're only using this arm. And so I know what we did is we ended up like switching places to switch our arms and like we would cheer each other on to keep going because we knew how hard it was to pedal, or not to pedal, to paddle, but we needed to keep going to get to the little alley where we could break apart. And as far as kayaking goes, your back is just uncomfortable and you just have to get over it. So maybe trying to adjust the seat like as soon as you get in, because it's really hard to like readjust the back and readjust your legs and stuff once you're in there because it's so easy to tip in the sea kayak. So you really need to make sure like you're comfortable and make sure the feet are right and the back is right before you get pushed into the water. Um, as far as camping and staying in the hostel, I have camped a lot growing up. My parents used to take us every year. Um, I guess the only issue we really ran into is one of the days we got there and I threw my stuff as it was raining into the tent and the tent had been flooded with water. So I guess my only advice is check the tent before you throw your stuff in there and just make sure that there's no holes, make sure nothing's leaking and that you don't have a big pool in your tent. Um, the sleeping bag, I had a mummy sleeping bag, which was awesome because it kept my feet close together and warm. And then the mummy came up over your head like this and actually had a drawstring that you could pull. And so it would kind of close in on your face. And I know some of the nights camping, it got pretty chilly. And so I ended up like pulling the drawstring and like sneaking down into my sleeping bag and trying to stay warm. And that was probably the best thing because normally I just have like a regular sleeping bag. And I've noticed that I was a lot warmer in the mummy style than I have been in ones I've used in the past. Also, you can dry your clothes. Um, Jeff taught me that you could dry your clothes by putting your wet clothes into a bag and then holding the bag with you inside the sleeping bag and your body heat dries the clothes that are in the bag which was really convenient because some of the times we didn't have a dry room or the dry room wasn't good but it was you know it's something to keep your clothes drier than how you went to sleep. Um, packing once again just being super you know what you need is using like bags inside of your bag so what I did is I went and got like um packing bags and so I use like one of them for all of my socks one of them for my bottoms one of them for my tops and so it was easy then when I would unpack at a campsite or at the hostel I wasn't pulling everything out of my bag looking for what I need then throwing everything back in I could just pull out the bags and I knew what was in each bag so it made it a lot easier to find things and to clean up every morning before we left 
As far as hostels, I've only stayed in one hostel before this, and it was in the Dominican Republic, but it was ran by a church. So we actually had the whole hostel to ourselves, and it was really just one hallway. There wasn't a front office. There wasn't a kitchen. There wasn't anything like that. And so I learned that it's a hostel that almost like a hotel, but a lot cheaper and a lot more packed. There's a lot of people in there, and they tend to put probably six to eight bunk beds, like six to eight sleeping bunk beds in a room, which is nice. And, you know, sometimes you get random people thrown in there, but that's one of the things you do when you're trying to save money on a hotel and staying in a hostel instead. They're really nice. They all have Wi-Fi. You know, they're... The last one we stayed in was really interesting because they had like wall paintings and each room had like a theme. And so they would have, you know, like one of them was like pizza and they had like different toppings of pizza over each bed. So, you know, just a little something, you know, to keep it interesting. Um, I also learned some people live there in the very last hostel. Um, I ended up speaking to a girl who had told me that she lived there. And so that was pretty cool. To think that people do that instead of like trying to get a house or try to get a apartment because it might be cheaper to do it that way, especially if you're not planning on staying there for long. If it's just, you know, a couple months or a year or something like that. Um, our very last day in the city was very beautiful. We got to see the palace, the castle, the Royal Mile, and we even went off the track a little bit. So we went up to the castle first and we got to see all the views there. And we had done a little research and saw that the castle's been used for more than just, you know, like a royal palace and things like that. That at one point it was actually a jail, which was super interesting to see. And then we also cut down and went through the prince's garden, which was nice and pretty. And then we actually saw the weirdest, coolest little thing like a Roomba that's for your house that does like carpet cleaning, like vacuuming. They had one of those, but it was for cutting the grass. And they had said it was like a new technology that they were trying out and to try to stay off the grass and things like that. And that was pretty cool to see. And I'm interested to see, you know, if that really takes off and if they end up using it more over there and then it comes over here. Because I think that would be a typical lazy American thing to do is to have someone cut your grass for you. I know I hate cutting grass, so I would definitely look into that. Um, we also saw that it's a huge tourist spot. It doesn't seem to be too local or ex or not quite like the Royal Mile that we saw didn't appear to be too local. It seemed like it was a lot of tourists. There were like tourist shops, every other store and things like that. Um, the palace was really pretty and I had a little gift shop and, you know, that's where the Queen Elizabeth stays when she comes to town, which I thought was really interesting. And we saw like a little puddle, like um, it almost looked, it was bigger than a bird feeder, but it was, it looked like something you would have outside of a government building, which it was outside their government building. So that's kind of the same that we have here. But it was like, I don't know, probably a foot or two deep. And they had kids swimming in it. Like parents had brought their kids with their bathing suits and were having them swim in it which we thought was strange that people just did that. And then we ended up seeing a sign later that said, don't swim in the pool. So it must have just been, you know, people, tourists visiting that didn't know any better, didn't read the signs. Um, the last thing is talking about how I'll use this in the future with my career. Um, so I will be teaching secondary math, high school math. And one of the big things we cover is like, when will I ever use this and things like that. And so, you know, we always talk about conversions, but this really was a prime example of using conversions, like doing our currency exchange. So anytime I would buy something in Scotland and it would tell me four euros, I would think, okay, well, it's almost $2 to a euro. So how much is it actually costing me in my money if it's only four euros? And then with the kilometers, so anytime that, Josh would tell us that it's, oh, it's just two kilometers around the bend. Okay, well, how many kilometers is it really? And then how would I convert that to miles? How? And then I would compare it to like a football field or something along those lines and kind of get perspective of how much is it for a 5K, how many miles, things like that. Um, I also have gone on three 
study short term study abroad trips with Winthrop during my time and I have loved every single one of them and I know that's something that I would like to do in my future classroom you know the first couple years of teaching is just surviving but after that I would really love to take my high schoolers maybe not on something so extreme in the beginning but take them on a short week trip somewhere and get them out and get them to see you know somewhere that they don't already know and even if the first couple ones aren't international even if they're just across the country or something like that I think it's really important for students to see the different cultures even within their own country especially having America being so many immigrants and so many different cultures in the melting pot I think there's a lot that they can learn from their own country and eventually I would like to take them to another country. I would love to take them to Greece because I think I could really relate that back to math and like the ancient mathematicians there. But I would really just love to keep seeing the world and I would love to have my kids see the world as well because I think that's really important. A lot of people tend to stay in the towns that they grew up in or they go off to college and then they go home to the towns that they've always known which is fine and there's nothing wrong with that. I just want them to have the opportunity to see what else is out there. Um, and I just think having those conversations is really important. Um, something else, I guess the final remark is, I just am so appreciative for having the opportunity. I know Going on this trip, there are a lot of people who applied to go, and I'm just extremely grateful that I got the opportunity to go. Um, this is the first time I did backpacking overnight, and I loved it. You know, I would love to do something like this again. Um, I think I need to do some more research on, you know, if I didn't have AOP carrying my bag all day and I didn't have them supplying me peanut butter and jellies, you know, how would I eat, you know, what trails are there here locally that I can do or I can take my dog on just for like a two or three day trail and really work up to doing another large trail like the West Highland Way, maybe without help or without, you know, having someone carry my bags for me. Because I just think that would be really cool and fun to do. Um, but I think that's it. Thank you for letting me go and let me have the time of my life. I hope this helps all future people.